We've passed the one-year mark of the pandemic this week in Canada. More than 900,000 cases, 22,000 deaths here alone. The impact on the emotional well-being is through the roof. Economically, the country's been savaged by the lockdowns to curb the spread, in particular now that there are more contagious variants. Vaccines are being distributed and giving many the impression that we are coming out of the woods. Well, the economic recovery will be much slower. Can vaccine passports help open up the economy again? Hello and welcome to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. We're coming to you from a remote location and practicing physical distancing to enhance safety. The Canada-U.S. border has been closed to non-essential travel for a year now. It has, uh, it's having a huge impact on the travel and tourism sectors. The federal government had urged Canadians to avoid non-essential travel, but some ignored that directive anyway. The airline industry has been crippled by the pandemic, and many countries are now looking at vaccine passports to get people moving again. But is it a silver bullet? No, no. But it does open up the possibility. Our unpublished vote question asks, do you feel vaccine passports will help reopen the economy? You can vote right now. Yes, no, or unsure. Log on and vote at unpublished.vote. Now, coming up on the Unpublished Cafe, we'll take a look at the idea and hear that many Canadians want to see these vaccine passports. Now, the vaccine passports do bring some ethical questions. We're going to delve into that. But first, Carl Moore is the Associate Professor at the Desitel Faculty of Management at McGill University, and he joins us now. And Carl, we've talked to airline and the pandemic quite a bit over the last year. Would a vaccine passport be a game changer for travel and tourism? I would say so. There's something where there's a lot of nervousness among Canadians to travel, but also foreigners to come to Canada. And this is, tourism is a huge business, foreign business people. It's enormous business in Canada and we need those people to come and we need Canadian business people to travel for the sake of our businesses and even travel within the country. So it's something where if people can do that with greater confidence and less of an onerous burden when they come to our country or when Canadians return home, this could be a considerable game changer for the industry, airlines and tourism, and in fact, business in general, it can make a huge difference for the airline industry, we believe. You know, when we look at the, you know, the vaccine rollout that's going right now, and we've got the seniors and we've got frontline workers, I'm thinking if you get vaccine passports so that the airline industry uh, can open up, and, uh, and we'll get people moving again. Those workers in the airline industry and airports, et cetera, are they not gonna have to move up to the front of the line in terms of the vaccination to keep that industry going? Well, that might be, uh, right. Like I've flown a couple of times uh, in the last year mm -hmm. and it's something where everybody at the airport, all the employees wear masks, they're, they're socially distanced because, but it's something where you go, we've gone food shopping or we may have done pickup at restaurants where there's people or in our local uh, shoppers drug mart where there's people in retail in contact with people all day. And a few people got sick, but by and large, if they follow the measures of masks and the social distancing and putting up glass or plastic, it seems to have worked well. I think we can do that uh, at airports. Um, it's important from a healthcare viewpoint and they should be fairly early in the process, I agree. But from a viewpoint of the airline industry, what they're looking for is passengers. And they want their employees to be, you know, uh, and they're being very careful with their employees because, right. you know, they are their people. But it's getting a, a huge number of people vaccinated, as we're seeing in the U.S., growing numbers. We see growing numbers in, in Israel and some other countries around the world, in the UAE, uh, in the Middle East as well. That's where you get to a critical mass. And then there's people can start traveling. That's what we need is to get that critical mass, which so the U.S. is... Now, the U.S. has traveled a lot even during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Now, Americans are a little bit more, a um, little less on average conservative than Canadians. But it's also at this point, they got a lot more of the vaccine. So I think yep. a key thing from Canadian viewpoint is get the vaccine in big numbers. And we're starting to get a bit better, but get it out there and get people vaccinated, which we're beginning to do. And in a few months, it's getting it down to where people in their 30s and 40s have it. So they can travel would be, I think, the point where it'd be a very big win. But again, if you have fit people in their 50s and 60s, they travel as well and allow them to travel. That's something I think is, is where the, the game changing aspect would come into play. 
Carl Moore joining us in the Unpublished Cafe, Associate Professor of the Days Hotel Faculty of Management at McGill University. We're talking about vaccine passports and how it could change the uh, travel and tourism sectors, not just in Canada, but right around the world as well as about uh, reopening uh, economies or around the world. And, you know, uh, Carl, not everybody can or will be vaccinated. And, you know, in this case, is that where rapid testing is, is going to have to come in for anybody who wants to travel? Well, something where you... you one is ra uh, getting the vaccine. And mm -hmm. the idea is maybe having a vaccine passport where you have some legal document that the world accepts that you've been vaccinated by medical authorities. So one is that you do, we could do is just in Canada and Air Canada or WestJet could accept, you know, that this is something from the province of Alberta, Ontario, Quebec or whatever. Right. Um, but then we get over to Europe, for example, or down to the States, you want something that they would recognize as well. So that you've you've had the vaccine now, some people be extremely careful. Might also have a COVID nineteen test, but it seems if you've been vaccinated, that that is less necessary. But today, for example, in Iceland and some other countries, you can get a test at the airport when you arrive. They give you the answer within an hour, and then you're free. But then they want you to have a second test a few days later, just to confirm right. it. So those are some of the things that are being done around the world. Um, but it seems if you have the vaccine and we're still getting the evidence, it seems and we're not as worried about the COVID-19 test or health authorities are more accurately. Iceland is a, an interesting analogy. Uh, the only problem with comparing with Canada is when population size and, and area size, it would make it a little, a little uh, easier to, to do something like that. Now, uh, in, in terms of, of a vaccine passport, would each country have their own or, or do you think what would be better is something that's universal recognized airports around the world? Well, I think it's something where it'd be nice to have a global standard. And, and I added the International Airline Transport Association, which is headquartered in Geneva and Montreal is for that, as well as ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. It's part of the United Nations look it's after civil aviation. They're actually headquartered here in Montreal. So know lots of people there and talk to them about it. The idea is to have a common format around the world. Now there's some concern about is this kind of, you know, uh, going to be a global government and they all have our data and there's some concerns about China having our data and, and things kind of like, you know, world authority and it scares some people, particularly in the States. So it might be more at the national level, but the idea is to have a standard, like an ISO standard, right. International Standard Organization. I was there on uh, the number of years ago on them as a member of the committee for uh, uh, chips on carts. So we came up with a global standard so that if you're in Asia, they can accept your card and they can accept it in Europe. So we said, it, and let's work together. A lot of argument and discussion come up with the world standard. So some things which are standard around the world. So, you know, example, mm -hmm. when you look at trains, there, there, there's a standard in Europe different than the States, but trains don't go from Europe to the States, but the US and Canada have the same standards. So our trains could go down to the US and our cars and so on. So there's some things where you wanna have uh, international standards and it's probably good to have an international standard, but not one global authority just would scare a lot of people around the world, particularly in the States. And they'd probably say, no way. Uh, just putting on your uh, your prognostic cap here, how, uh, how far in the future do you suspect that we might see a vaccine passport? I think it's something which there's already talk about it and there's some already progress made like Israel and the UAE are two countries in the world where they're probably there's small populations in the healthcare system in Israel and there's a bunch of explanations, but they really have done a lot of vaccinating. I talked to a couple of uh, former students in Dubai recently. They really have made a lot of progress getting the country vaccinated. So th there is already people abs absolutely looking into it right now, making progress on it. And so those conversations uh, are happening in various parts of the world. So it is moving forward already. Carl, thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure, Ed. Carl Moore is Associate Professor of the Desertel Faculty of Management at McGill University. Now, when Canadians consider the vaccine passport, they're torn, according to Main Street research numbers. Keto Maggie is the president and CEO of Main Street, and he joins us now. And, and Keto, how are Canadians feeling about getting a vaccine passport? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. You know, the, 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 the question that we, we asked a series of questions about 
uh, travel related uh, uh, questions in our last survey for iPolitics. The first one being is, do you think Canadians should be able to travel freely once they're vaccinated? I mean, I think, you know, we've done a number of studies now. There's a number of other polls, ours included out there, showing that there is this pent up demand for travel once the pandemic is over. It's going to be, you know, uh, smash previous records. Um, mm -hmm. At least that, that's what's expected. Um, and so on that basis, uh, you know, people do want to be able to travel freely. And that obviously means that they will have to have some kind of, so not surprising, you know, that 35% of Canadians strongly agree that we should develop a, a vaccine passport, whatever, whatever that means. I mean, I, I don't think, uh, you know, different countries are going to do different things, whether it's a digital thing or, or some kind of paper form. Um, I, I think the fact that 35% strongly agree is, is, you know, shows that at least among the people who want to travel, they're, they're going to want this vaccine passport and, and certainly that it's something that the government should start thinking about. Do do Canadians want limitations on, on, on the vaccine passport or they want it to be like a get out of jail free card? Well, so so there's where the opinions are mixed. So a, a majority of people think that Canadians should be able to travel uh, uh, post pandemic or sorry, not post pandemic, but once they are vaccinated. Hmm. Uh, only a small number, about 15% think that it should be without any restrictions. Um, another 35% think that you should be able to travel to countries that have at least the, the, the same level of vaccination as Canada or greater. So say that whether it's the United States or EU and maybe to other destinations, uh, not to limit it. And then there is a big chunk, you know, almost 40% of the population that says, no, like not until every Canadian is vaccinated and, and until we know vaccines are, are effective against variants and other things, mm -hmm. um, that that Canadians shouldn't be able to travel freely until that time. Uh, um, I personally land in the first column. I, I I can't wait to travel. Yeah, it, it's been a while. I I can say that, but uh, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how the whole vaccine passport uh, works. Whether it, each country has its own, or whether it's going to be uh, a universal uh, global kind of kind of thing. But you know, Keto, I'm I'm curious. What, what which Canadians are most in support of of getting the the vaccine the vaccine passport? Are we talking about seniors? Are we talking about men, women? Who who who's most in support? Um, uh, sorry, I I don't have that exact number sitting right in front of me. Um, uh, actually, it's it, it is highest among um. The, the, the group that most strongly agrees with the vaccine passport are seniors uh, mm -hmm. over 65, 41% strongly agree, 21% somewhat agree, uh, just 9% uh, somewhat disagree and 10% and uh, strongly disagree. You know, compare that to the younger cohort, it's, you know, 28 and 23 uh, among 18 to 34s with 11% and 20% uh, disagreeing. Um, so, so I, I think certainly it's people who are, uh, you know, in, there's a large population in Canada of snowbirds who travel hmm. to, to the U S pretty regularly. And, and I think a lot of those people are the, are the first people who are going to want to travel. Are, are, you had mentioned, you expect that once we get the, everybody vaccinated, a, a, a big burst of travel, like, is, is that all of a sudden everybody's just going to say, okay, we're all clear. We've all got the vaccine. We're all going to the traveling we it's yeah it's yeah. literally at its uh, I, I mean uh, i wrote a piece for ipolitics as a follow-up just to quantify uh what that poll result meant 20 percent of canadians are telling us they're going to want to travel within the first three months post pandemic now what de defining what the end of the pandemic is it's, it's different mm -hmm. um but 20 percent that's not you know that's seven million people that, like just that that's going to shatter travel records. And then like in three to six months, it's another big number. It's an even bigger number. It's going to shatter records again. Um, so that at least that first year, it's going to be compared to the last pre-pandemic uh, quarter uh, of, of, of 2019, that last quarter, which is when a lot of people travel because it includes the, the, the Christmas holidays, it's going to shatter those records, which at the time were 
all time records already. Mm -hmm. um, at least that that is the potential for the demand. So I, I, I think there will be a lot of um, that pent up demand will be there. Whether or not we'll be able to travel anywhere, that's really, I mean, you know, I think most Canadians know that like they want to do it, but they want to do it safely. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Keto, I want to thank you for joining us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Ed. Keto Maggie is the president and CEO of Main Street Research. When it comes to vaccine passports, some see them splitting us up even more. Francoise Bayless is a university research professor and an expert in bioethics at Dalhousie University. And she joins us now. And Francoise, from your perspective, vaccine passports will not open the economy, right? Well, I think that people are assuming a lot of things about vaccine passports when they make this claim that it will open the economy. And I think what we need to be understanding is we're actually lacking sufficient scientific data to support that claim because we don't actually know yet what the impact of the vaccine is on transmissibility, meaning your ability to infect others. So we know it will protect you from becoming infected, but we don't know that you're not still walking around potentially infecting others. So that's the huge assumption underlying the claim that it's going to help us reopen the economy. And we're actually missing the science to support that claim. So technically somebody, or I guess from your perspective, you're saying somebody could be vaccinated, but they could still technically have the, the, the virus in them and possibly being able to transmit it afterwards, right? Is that it? That's correct. They could still be transmitting the virus. So this whole idea of vaccine passports is premised on the belief that A, once you've received a vaccine, you are protected and will not get infected, and B, that you will not go out and infect others. And the thing that's important is that a lot of the clinical trials that were done in order to get us vaccines in this very short period of time focused on the first issue. Will it protect you from becoming infected, becoming sick? And so we have robust data about that for a number of different vaccines. And we're only now starting to get some data about this issue of um, transmissibility and your ability to infect others. We think you, there will be an impact on that, but we don't yet know how much, we don't know for how long, and all the new variants we're hearing about is making that even more complicated. So this could actually provide a false sense of security for, for people who, you know, they think they've been vac they're, they have been vaccinated, but they think they can't transmit it to anybody else nor catch it again. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that you'll hear public health um, messaging around. They're very clearly saying to people, even if you have the vaccine, you have to continue with all of the public health measures that you have been hopefully you know, respecting to date. And so one of the things to think about is many people were quite enthusiastic when they saw that Israel had introduced its green pass and used this in a public context in order for people to attend a concert. But one of the things that's important to recognize is if you actually saw the images of that concert, People were still socially distanced, people were still wearing masks, et cetera, and it was an outdoor event, right? So all mm -hmm. of those public health measures were still in place. And that's the sort of thing that has people like myself saying, well, why did you need to have this vaccine passport on top of that? Why couldn't everybody have been eligible to go to that concert if they were prepared to respect public health measures? And if you will, that brings us back to the opening comment People like myself are worried about creating this divide between the haves and the have nots. And we've used this language of the immunoprivileged and the immunodeprived. And we worry about introducing this kind of documentation, which some people think will be great because they'll be able to move about without paying sufficient attention to who will now not be able to move about or not be able to access public venues that they could do otherwise following public health measures. Oh, that would just be inconvenient. We don't want to think about that, do we? <laughs> well, not only are we not thinking about inconvenient, if we really want to think about something concrete, many people have said how important it is, for example, that they get back into bars and restaurants. Hmm. Well, if we take that as a concrete example, many of the people who work in those uh, establishments uh, are amongst the last to get the vaccine. So are we saying that you can come and work here 
you can take the risk of getting infected because you're not vaccinated, but you actually couldn't be a patron here. You couldn't come in as a guest, um, but you can serve us. And so I think we have some very strange ideas about the practicalities when we actually start unpacking. How do you really think this is going to work? You know, that that's something I had, had considered as well is, uh, OK, if you've got these vaccine passports and then thus more people are going to be traveling, thus you've got well, obviously pilots, airline, uh, airline workers, airports, all those people. Well, do they then just all of a sudden, because this industry is starting to open up, is going to move to the front of the line to get the vaccination then? That's, well, I, I think, going to be a bit of a question we're going to have to answer. Well, I'd be very worried about that happening because I actually think then you're really looking at an injustice, if you will. And that's because right now, at least in Canada, the focus for vaccination has been on those who are most at risk. And that's why we've started with elderly populations who are in long-term care facilities. We've included um, healthcare workers who are frontline healthcare workers, hopefully not just those working in the back offices. Uh, we've even privileged our Indigenous communities in the North who are disadvantaged. Advantaged. And so we have a focus that says who's most at risk and can we get the vaccine to them first in order to protect them. What you now see is economic interests coming into play and being layered on top of what I would think of as equity issues. And I'm not willing to trade off those kinds of priorities for the economy. What better options do you have to, uh, I guess, to suggest and in, in, in to get the economy opening up to get people moving again, as opposed to the vaccine passport? Well, what I think is really important is that we increase vaccination. Mm -hmm. And we need to really pay attention to that because our goal is to get to population immunity. Because if we can reach population immunity, then those people who are not vaccinated, either through choice or because of medical constraints, et cetera, will in fact also be protected. And so this idea that you need this kind of certification that you can prevent, provide, um, you know, whether it's at a border or in the workplace, et cetera, actually becomes superfluous almost, I would say. Now, you know, one thing I do want to say really clearly is one of the things I've been trying to get people to understand is we need to change our language around this documentation because we're talking about it as a passport and sometimes I use the term colloquially just because people are using that language. Yeah. But one of the things I try to say to people is there's a lot of problems with the idea of a passport because you're then thinking that you have to provide this documentation in places where we have never done that before. So for example, people have suggested that you would use this for travel between provinces. I think that's crazy. Do we really want to live in a country where to go from one province to another, we have to provide biological data? Right now, we can do that traveling. There are constraints, but the constraints are public health constraints. So I know that if I travel to other parts of the country and I leave my province of Nova Scotia, that when I come back, I will have to quarantine for 14 days. But that means everybody's in the same boat. And then if I get back to what I was talking about mm -hmm. before, I think what's really important is to recognize we shouldn't be creating exceptional policy here. We should be relying on really good policy that we already have in place. So what do I mean? The fact of the matter is everybody who gets a vaccine needs documentation. They need some kind of certification. You can't put something in someone's arm and not tell them what it is. They need that in order to continue to protect themselves. Public health needs that. And so what you have is you will have, we Canadians will have vaccine certification. The question is, will we use that in other places for goals that are not to do with public health measures? And then you come with the idea of you're gonna transform this very legitimate kind of documentation into something which in some arenas can be suspect, can result in discrimination, can certainly hurt marginalized communities and will certainly hurt all of those people who cannot be vaccinated. Francoise, there's a, a lot to uh, really digest in this one. I, I'm kind of wondering, you know, when we look at the vaccine passport or the way it's described, and, and there seems to be that big hole you can, you can drive a truck through, and that being whether or not the vaccine means you can't transmit anymore. Uh, are we at the point now it's, you know, we're just over just past a year in, uh, we've heard other than 
uh, about the the illness. We've heard nothing about the economic destruction here. Are we grasping at straws, or maybe are our politicians grasping at straws to try and get things open up again? I think so. And I have to say that part of the reason I think that is right now, all of that initiative is not based in good science. And one of the things that I think we've been trying throughout this past year is to have evidence informed policy. And in fact, many times people have been upset by certain decisions made by politicians saying this isn't grounded in science. And so, you know, might we get to a point where we have robust data about whether or not it affects transmissibility? Yes. So should we have the conversation now in the event that we get to a point where we have that data and we think we can use it in ways that are fair and just? Absolutely. So I think it's really great that we talk about what are the ethical issues with this and what are some of the possible negative consequences? Because we're all pretty clear on what the positive consequences yeah. are going to be, right? Um, and so again, in that context, I've encouraged people to think about the following. If we think that we're going to get the science which will confirm the impact of vaccines on transmissibility, and we think that here's an important analogy to other vaccines like yellow fever, and we do want to have that be part of constraints traveling across borders, then what are our obligations over the next couple of years around the world as we begin to travel, believing that we're protected because we have a vaccine, but we're going into countries where they don't have access to vaccine. And so there is a really important ethical issue for us to be thinking about what are our obligations? Is this just about the privilege getting to run around the world again, so to speak? But are you going to then be creating problems for other places? And those are the kinds of reasons why we want to have robust science behind any policy that we would develop. And, you know, to be fair, one of the complications here is that these are not decisions Canada can make on its own. Canada will, in fact, be, if you will, buffeted by the winds in terms of what other countries will or will not do that will impact what Canadians can or cannot do. My own view is that, at least for now, we should follow the science. We should also support the WHO. The WHO is currently working on standardizing the information that would be needed for some kind of digital certification, but they're very explicit in saying this certification at this point in time should not be used for travel. So I think what you have there is an appropriate response saying if we're going to have anything we want it to be standardized around the globe so that everybody has access to the same information. We're going to also want to look really carefully at issues around privacy, hacking, etc. If we're going to be moving from paper documentation to digital documentation. And then beyond that, we need to know that we're not going to disproportionately harm parts of the globe. Bryce Waz, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Francois Bayless is a university research professor, specialty in bioethics at Dalhousie University. And now you can vote at our unpublished vote question. Do you feel vaccine passports will help reopen the economy? Yes, no, or unsure? You can log on right now and vote at unpublished.vote. I want to thank our guest today, Carl Moore, associate professor at the Days Hotel a faculty of management at McGill University. Keto Maggie is the president and CEO of Main Street Research. And Francois Bayless is a university research professor, specialty in bioethics at Dalhousie University. And I want to thank you for watching the Unpublished Cafe. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.